All right, next we have Noah Therm. How you doing? Uh, following a pretty pretty tough panel to, <laughs> to follow up there. You got me in a tough spot in the, on in the lineup, Nick. But but uh, ha happy to share. Oh no, of course. I mean, if you guys don't know Noah, Noah is is working with Driveline uh, with hitting mechanics and hitting development, um, and I. I'm excited to see your panel. I think you have a lot of smart things to tell us all. Um, obviously, give Noah a follow at the Terminator 13. Why 13? Uh, wore it as a kid, like through high school. Um, I guess wasn't really, really considering luck. Um, I think from a young age, I was just so focused on um, identifying salient skills uh, that that I wanted to remove luck from my outcomes and just go yeah. with, just go with 13. There we go, right? Embrace the unlucky 13. I mean, that's why A-Rod had success, right? That's definitely what it was. Did you wear 13? I'm pretty sure you did. I don't know. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Anyway, Noah, I'm going to let you to your devices. And thanks for sharing your screen. I'm going to put it up right now. And yeah, can't wait for this. All righty. So pretty good segue uh, from, a, from a panel on, on prospects. Um, like, like Nick mentioned, my, my name is Noah Thurm. Uh, I'm a baseball operations analyst at Driveline Baseball. I'm a sophomore at Georgetown University uh, who works primarily with, with our hitters. Um, and so I'm, I'm following up prospects with, with a bit of a talk on player development. Uh, you know, a lot of the public facing analysis purely by the limitations of the publicly available data is, is on major league talent. Um, and so I wanted to, to give a little insight into how we do things at driveline, what, you know, some of that analytics work looks like at, at lower levels of the game with access to, you know, more and, and different kinds of data uh, and, and really sort of explain and, and walk through uh, the role analytics plays in not only, you know, evaluating and analyzing players, but in developing them as well. Um, uh, and to do that. So Noah, really quickly, you just want to hit the hide button so you don't uh, have that button up the entire time. That's all. <laughs> Probably a good move. But uh, yeah, so so the three main points I want to touch on today are going to be the, the tech we use um, and the data we collect, uh, the, the tools we seek to identify and, and train in our players, and then finally, how we go about programming our guys um, and, and really training training those tools that we've determined are important. So uh, with that said, if I can go to the next slide. Right, so I like to think about player development as much as we can from like a systems level of view. Um, and so I think about it as, as sort of a, a mutually dependent ecosystem uh, of parts here. Uh, first being, like I mentioned, uh, the tech, so system design and data collection, right? I, I can't do any analysis if I don't have any data. So coming up with robust systems for collecting, cleaning, and processing data um, is, is essential, particularly on the scale we do it at, at Driveline. Uh, next, the, the tools, um, as I sort of poorly alluded to uh, in explaining the 13, uh, in terms of, of tools, we, we want to separate skill from outcome as best we can. Uh, I cannot train luck. Uh, I wish I could. Um, and with the exception of like Omar Narvaez's luck defying ability to just hit bloop singles, like uh, those are not particularly resilient outcomes. So we want to separate process from outcome uh, as much as we can and, and hone in on, on repeatable skills. Uh, third, when we're talking about training and, and programming guys, uh, it's really getting them from from where they are now to to the place they want to be in the future. Obviously, you know the goal for for pretty much everyone is to produce produce at the highest level possible, both you know reaching the, the highest level of the game possible, but but playing to to the most of their ability. Um, and then finally, because the audience is not particularly player development skewed, um, I'll, I'll touch briefly on some evaluation stuff and and how. I work a lot of the, the player development um, information into how I think about players, you know, at the big league level or evaluating a prospect and, and turning, you know, sort of our assessment procedures into projection and analysis. Um, so jumping right in to, to start, we're going to talk about the tech we use one because it's cool stuff and it's like fun to play with. Um, 
but also it, it really you know sets the ground floor for for everything else that we're able to do um, in terms of capturing capturing all the data about a particular player. So on that note, uh, I've grouped the tech we use into three rough categories. Like there are hangers on and, and other things that they do make an appearance, but this is really the bread and butter um, and, and how we drive a lot, a lot of our analysis, some of which most people are probably familiar with, others maybe not as much. So the first group is the launch monitors. So these are uh, the, the mostly optical, some radar based uh, tracking systems that are going to get you what I'll, what I'll call like stack cast style metrics, right? Once the ball is struck, uh, it'll tell you the exit velocity, launch angle, all of that, you know, direction, direction stuff. Um, and then depending on the system, things like batted ball spin, which some people like to use as a proxy for contact quality. Um, and one of the cooler insights that we get off of our chosen launch monitor that isn't in publicly available data coming out of StatCast is three-dimensional point of contact. So not just like X and Y zone locations, but also the, the depth of contact, which turns out to be pretty important and, and factors into a lot, lot of analysis uh, that we do as, as I will talk about later. So the second sort of broad category is your bat sensors. So this, uh, it, the launch monitor answers what happens after contact, the bat sensor fills in the blank of what went on before. So the, the speed of the bat, uh, the attack angle, which is for most guys, right, the, the, the positive angle, uh, the direction of the bat is taking into contact. Uh, vertical bat angle is the angle between like the, the horizontal and where your barrel is. So if the barrel is below your hands, uh, it's a greater vertical bat angle than, than being purely flat and stuff like time to contact. And then the last group is sort of the most amorphous and, and the least strictly defined uh, this is going to be everything that that tells us anything about how a guy is moving physically. So this is some like markered uh, motion capture, like we have here at Driveline, uh, where guys are you know hitting in their underpants with dots all over them, like they're you know filming a CGI scene in a movie, uh, and then some like sensor or like Bluetooth-based solutions that that I'll mention um, that come at a you know significantly lower price point, lower barrier to entry. Um, and get you some of that same information about like how all the segments of your body are positioned, how they're moving, how fast they're going, where they're going. Um, stuff that's really, really hard to answer from like a two dimensional video um, because guys are moving in 3D space. And so it, I think the, the robustness, the level of mechanical analysis you can do off 2D video you know, it get, gets exhausted pretty quickly. So it, it's pretty cool to be able to, to reconstruct like a 3D, 3D picture of the swing using some of this tech. Um, so on the, on the role of those launch monitors, that first group, uh, the biggest role in player development is um, one, quantifying, you know, the, the skill of how hard you hit the ball, but also on the training floor, providing instant feedback for all of our guys. Like we have uh, multiple massive TVs up that display like, exactly the output you're seeing here after each swing. So guys sort of learn to auto-regulate um, and also like everyone wants to hit the ball hard every time, which is, you know, maybe surprisingly, hopefully not, like not always the case when guys show up, right? And it isn't always the, the style of training guys are accustomed to. Um, so it, it's good to give that feedback. So everyone's on the same page and, and we really are just objectively evaluating every single batted ball. Um, so some quick notes on, on things we look for here, uh, contact quality, you know, depending on the system, you can get live like zone tracking, like you see in the bottom right there. Um, things like barrel consistency. If, if we're significantly poorer to one side of the field than the other, it's sort of hard to always understand that in, in a batting cage with a narrow tunnel absent this feedback. So sort of, you know, projecting onto the field, um, is pretty helpful. And the major players in this tech space are, are hit tracks, which is what we use primarily at Rap Soto, uh, TrackMan, which was was in major league stadiums and, and until uh, Hawkeye took over, and, and then Yakker Tech is a solution that's that's more popular at the college level, um, but, but gaining gaining some gaining some popularity. Um, so just a brief example of the the type of analysis, the type of insight that that these systems provide us. Uh, you see here a couple of uh, visualizations uh, I, I did focusing on, on a player's point of contact uh, from when he started training with us to 
to uh, now. So uh, an emphasis for this player uh, was to decrease his average point of contact, you know, bring it, bring it back. Uh, this was a guy who needed a lot of, I call it runway to, to work up the bat speed um, and, and needed to hit the ball further out front to, to really do damage, which most guys will hit the ball harder out in front. Like that's a rule you have longer to accelerate the bat. Um, but moving it, moving it deeper buys us some adjustability and there are some other benefits. Uh, so being able to visualize that pretty quickly because of the tech um, is cool and, and insight we wouldn't get otherwise. Like it, it's, you can have a rough idea of how hard you're hitting the ball on a given day. At full speed, uh, I, I would have a hard time believing that, that anyone's really keeping track of, of point of contact um, uh, you know, live w without, the, without the assistance of technology. So, so just uh, you know, a quick blurb about a data point that, that isn't publicly available at the major league level, um, but, but we end up doing a lot with. Uh, so moving on to bad sensors, uh, as as I mentioned, this sort of fills in fills in those blanks of what happened before before contact. And and if you'll remember, like one of the one of the goals here in player development is separating skill from outcome. And while you know how hard you hit the ball is over a large enough sample, ultimately a reflection of your skill. Um, on any given batted ball, like any number of things could have happened that that sort of obscure that. So so bad sensors. Um, help us in, in sort of having a more stable description of what's going on in your swing and, and how skilled the player is on every single swing he takes, not just the balls he ends up hitting the hardest or needing to wait long enough for, for some of those output or outcome metrics to, to stabilize. Um, so here we're looking at, you know, bat and hand speed, uh, swing path and plane. Uh, rotational acceleration is... Um, sort of explaining how deep players develop their bat speed, the, the, the higher their rotational acceleration, um, the more bat speed they're generating sooner, um, as well as direction with some things like vertical bat angle and the like. Um, and the two you know, most common solutions are, are blast motion sensors and diamond kinetics. Um, like we did with the launch monitor, just a quick example of, of some of the insight we can get from, from these bat sensors. Uh, looking quickly at how a player performs over certain attack angle ranges can be pretty valuable when we're trying to understand like an optimal or an ideal swing path in plane. Like, you know, as, as much as the public wants to, or some parts of the public want to decry like the launch angle swing, um, you know, it, it isn't uniformly the case that 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 uh, outcomes are best for guys at, at steeper swing paths. Um, so being able to know, you know, objectively for an individual where they're hitting the ball hardest with their current bat path, maybe that's amenable to trying to build in, you know, some more steepness, hit balls hard in the air. Maybe it's not, but we wouldn't really know that absent absent the, the bat sensor. It's really hard to sort of come to that understanding. And uh, I think you lose a lot of personalization and, and individualization in, in player development if we don't have the, this data available. And on the right there, uh, you see some distributions of uh, one of BLAST's metrics called connection, which is the uh, angle between the bat and the player's spine through rotation. Um, just a quick example of, of something else we can do with that. Uh, loose benchmarks, 90 degrees, right? Like perpendicular bat to, to spine is sort of what we shoot for early in the swing. Um, things will fluctuate a little bit into contact based on the, the pitch height. So we, we don't want to, you know, it's not an end all be all, um, but some pretty cool information that, that we wouldn't know otherwise. And finally, that, that last sort of uh, bucket here of, of motion analyzers really lets us get at, at biomechanics uh, in a way, like I mentioned, is sort of impossible to do otherwise, um, which can make it make it pretty valuable. So we're we're looking here at like positioning, so where each part of their body is in relation to the others throughout the entirety of the swing, kinematics, like how fast everything is moving and how they're rotating and in what directions. Um, sequencing is a big one, like the order in which things happen in the swing. Um, is pretty important. There's not universal agreement on what like a good sequence is. There are 
There is universal agreement on what like a biomechanically efficient sequence is, um, which is you know bigger, bigger muscles, bigger segments go fastest first, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but but there is definitely gray area there for a guy's individual movement patterns. Um, and on the right, you'll see a, a screen grab from uh, that first sensor solution, the K-Vest. Uh, the y-axis there is peak rotational speed. The x-axis is in time. And then each colored line is a different segment of, of the guy's body. So the red is the pelvis, the green is the torso, the blue is the lead arm, and the brown is the hand. And this is a, a depiction of what would be considered like a biomechanically efficient sequence where our largest segment, the, the hips, the pelvis reaches its peak rotational speed first, directly followed by the torso, then the hand, then the arm, and, and then the hand in order moving from uh, most fixed to most free, biggest to smallest, however you want to put it. Um, but like I said, this isn't necessarily a hill we need to, to die on. And then there are also some optical optical solutions here, like Optitrack and Kinetrax. Some, as I mentioned, are markered and, and others aren't. Um, so, you know, nothing too in depth here, but just another brief look at how we sort of analyze sequencing and, and look at the distribution of uh, your, your peak rotational uh, speeds, just to give us an idea of like, how often that sequence breaks down, uh, how guys are moving through the swing, um, and 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 how well you know everything is working together. And then on the right there, uh, just to give you an idea of what like the the full soup can do, what the full you know high speed camera optical solutions can get you. You're looking at full like 3D recreations of every event right after. And you see a bunch of skeleton guys running around playing baseball. It's a pretty cool visual um, and, and can drive some pretty interesting insights as well. So I know that's a lot, but we've now covered, you know, what we're using, how we're getting data, what the data is, a little bit about uh, what we think is important and, and what I tend to care about on, on the, you know, analysis end. Um, but really the, the, meat, the meat of player development in, in my mind is determining uh, what tools we need to develop and what skills ultimately are going to give the player the best opportunity for success. Um, and I think it, it, it's not that it's not obvious, but I think it's not often discussed. Like training time is an incredibly limited resource. Um, and there are only so many swings we can ask a guy to take in a given day. Um, so we have to be pretty good and pretty judicious about where we place emphasis uh, and how we spend like training economy to get the most bang for our buck. And, and, and this is what takes the most grunt work on the analytics side um, is looking at the data and trying to come to some understanding of, of what ends up mattering and what we need to spend time developing. So at, at Driveline, uh, we depart not hugely, but certainly uh, we depart from like the power hit tool model um, that's you know common common in scouting those are sort of amorphous in their own right and can encompass a lot of things or very few things all at the same time and, and there isn't universal agreement um, but to move towards like a more complete uh, more robust and, and more consistent description of, of the skills we care about we've developed what we call the big three um, so the first being output, uh, the second being your bat to ball skill, and, and the third one being swing decisions. So all of these make an appearance in one way or another in every scouting report, um, but we want to take a more clear and, and quantitative tilt to how we define and then ultimately ultimately measure these. So starting from, from left to right uh, with output, this is pretty much an analog for the power tool um, the interesting parts here are, are what we use to measure it and, and how we come to those conclusions. Um, but this is really just your, your max capacity, right? Like how, how hard can you hit the ball? Um, it's mattered forever. It likely always will. Um, and it is certainly worth training. 
Uh, so the two metrics we use to assess output are top one eighth exit velocity, uh, the justifications for which I'll give in a minute, uh, and then bat speed. So one a little more, you know, outcome dependent, uh, the other entirely in the player's control being bat speed um, and, and something that is, you know, sort of directly trainable. So then uh, we look at you know, the bat to ball skill um, and, and the ability of a hitter to make both frequent and high quality contact. Uh, neither of those on their own, in my mind, answers this question. Um, very frequent but low impact contact will not get you to the big leagues and very high quality, but you know, almost, almost invisible contact won't get the job done either. Um, so I think whatever solution or whatever answer you, you offer to, to assessing bat to ball skill uh, necessarily has to, to answer both those questions, which we do in gym with a metric called uh, smash factor, um, which not an innuendo, I promise. Uh, and then because it's, it relies on some things that aren't publicly available, I'll also talk a little bit about like how to come to a piecemeal, piecemeal solution using amalgamations of contact numbers, hard hit rates, and, and whiff rates as well. And then finally, uh, I'd put it you know, lowest in order of importance, um, but still makes the big three would be swing decisions um, and, and going to the plate with with a, a solid understanding of your approach um, and and you know like pitch selection lets you lets you really make the most of those other skills. Um, I think we can you know universally agree that some pitches are just harder to hit than others. Uh, so the more often you can you can live on the easier to hit end of that spectrum, uh, the more you can make use of those other skills, and the easier your life becomes as a hitter. As a hitter, which which I think makes makes swing decisions worth worth considering. Um, and, and I'll go a little more in depth into how we do that here. Uh, but again, um, in, in, in a more public facing way with, with data that's, that's freely available, I think looking at, uh, swing frequency and, and contact frequency are really going to be the two, the two building blocks, um, as I will, as I will explain. So starting with output, um, I'm going to walk through a little bit of how we how we select a metric, both like theoretically, just the process itself, and then how we came to, to these specifically. Um, so the, the criteria we use come from uh, Jonathan Judge at, at BP, and we've sort of adapted in our own way, but pretty much uh, we're looking at the reliability of a metric. So is it consistent for a given player year to year? Um, in player development, we're interested in developing skills, right? If things are chance outcomes that aren't repeatable um, and aren't consistent for, for an individual, you know, within reason, hopefully they, they get better. Um, it's probably not worth training and, and it isn't reliable, which is probably of these three criteria, the, the most important uh, in PD. Second, descriptiveness. Uh, does this, this metric, does this skill, uh, correlate to to present outcomes, right? Like, is it helpful? Uh, does it matter, right? Like, if we have a really reliable skill, really reliable metric um, that has like a negative correlation with production, like, it's not worth training, um, as sticky as it may be year to year. And then finally, we look at the predictiveness of a metric. Is your performance now predictive at all of your future success? Um, if we improve it by a percent, a standard deviation, you know, while you train with us, will that, you know, improve your chances of, of performing down the line, which is ultimately uh, the entire goal. So when we're talking about output, like I mentioned, our go-to is top one eighth exit velocity. So this is the average exit velocity of the top 12 and a half percent of the balls you hit. And the biggest reason being, uh, it's more reliable year to year than mean, median, and, and max exit velocities, which makes it a better proxy of true skill, therefore having higher utility in, in player development, as well as in, in player analysis generally, right? If we're trying to understand how good a guy is, we should probably be using uh, as reliable of, of metrics as possible. And just sort of as an as item of interest here, uh, it's exactly as predictive of 
the following year's Wobicon as, as the present year's Wobicon. Uh, so you'll see in the, the correlation table at the, at the bottom, uh, in the row positions, you have the prior year. In the column positions, you have uh, the, the following year. And if you look all the way on the right in that Wobicon column, uh, top eighth exit velocity and Wobicon have identical uh, correlation coefficients to, to the following year's Wobicon. So it is not only like a sticky and, and reliable measure of skill, um, but, but correlates highly with, with outcomes, um, both in the present year and the following. So it sort of ticks, ticks all three of those boxes. Uh, and then on the bat speed side, like I've sort of mentioned, the, um, the greatest utility is how quickly it stabilizes. I know there are people who don't love that word, but, but in about seven swings, uh, the metric is reliable. Um, it's entirely in the hitter's control. Uh, which means we can sort of train it, train it in isolation, in, in a vacuum. Uh, and there's, there's no overlap with either other skill. So in, in, you know, in the world where we're trying to really isolate and separate skills from each other to, to get a complete picture of a hitter uh, and minimize that overlap, um, bat speed becomes very useful. Um, in terms of descriptiveness and predictiveness, it's not available um, on, on major league data. But we know that, that the faster you swing the bat, the harder you hit the ball. So if we know that exit velocity is both descriptive and predictive of performance, uh, we, can be, we can be assured that the bat speed will be as well. So that's why we chose these two. That's why we think they matter. Uh, and, and ultimately, it's going to form the foundations of, of everything we do with the player. So in conceptualizing development and you know, analysis on, on guys currently in the big leagues. I think of output as setting uh, both the ceiling and the floor of, of production. Um, as I'll talk about where you're going to fall between those, I think is reliant and, and dependent on those other skills. Um, but I think that the, you know, your, your max exit velocity or your max game, game power, it certainly puts a pretty hard ceiling on, on your performance as well as raising your floor. Um, even if your bat to ball skill is relatively poor or you never really get to like the upper percentiles of your exit velocity, a 70% ball of 120 max exit velocity is still going faster than a 70% ball of a hundred mile an hour max exit velocity. So, so it also raises your floor, um, which means that in my mind, training output can sort of shift the whole like window of possible outcomes for a player when we're talking about production, um, which is why I, I would prioritize it over the others. Um, hitting the ball harder uh, uh, affords you greater margin for error um, at, you know, like I said, lower, lower percentages of, of your like optimal outcome, uh, as well as allows your power tool or your output uh, to be more resilient through what I'll loosely refer to as adversity, guessing a pitch wrong, hitting off time, tough location, any deviation from like ball sitting on a tee, uh, you'll probably lose some exit velocity. So if you have more, more to burn to, to start with, uh, you'll be better off. And, and on the right there, um, just quickly, doesn't need a ton of reiteration, but hitting the ball harder is just strictly preferable to hitting the ball less hard at any like reasonable, reasonable launch angle where balls were going to, were going to do any damage otherwise. Um, it's pretty much uniformly better to be able to hit the ball harder. Like, I, I don't think that needs, that need, people need much convincing on that, but always good uh, as a reminder. So in terms of uh, the bat to ball skill, We've, we've moved on from absolute output, like purely, you know, the, the number on the radar gun to, to something that describes relative output and how much of your bat speed you turn into exit velocity, which is pretty much exactly what Smash Factor does. So the equation, which is at the bottom of the slide there, comes from research done by Professor Alan Nathan on collision efficiency. Uh, in fact, the, the second term, the, the fraction there, is exactly the collision efficiency of the bat and ball at contact. How much 
energy effectively are you transferring from your bat to the ball uh, through contact? Which certainly answers the, the quality of contact question um, on, on a relative basis, right? So you're not, you're not punished here if you can't swing as fast as John Carlos Stanton. You can score as well as he does uh, by hitting the ball relatively as hard. Uh, but it doesn't on its own answer the frequency question. Um, which, as I've said, is pretty important to, to assessing bat, uh, bat to ball skill. Um, and the way we account for that is when we're sort of, or, or when I'm reporting a, a smash factor score or number or whatever to, to a hitting trainer or anyone else, when we take an average, uh, we include in the denominator as zero uh, whiffs and foul balls. So rather than just looking at you know, pure frequency, weighting all contact the same, uh, getting like a, a contact rate this way where, where the quality of that contact is included by using smash factor, we can answer both of those questions under one roof uh, with, with one metric. Like I said, unfortunately, because it does rely on bat speed at the swing level, uh, it isn't reproducible on major league on major league data quite yet. Hopefully the, 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 you know, the, the landscape changes a little bit uh, but but in the present day, we're a little bit limited. Um, and then on the right there, you'll see uh, a graph charting uh, Cronbox Alpha, which sounds scary, but is our preferred measure of, of uh, metric reliability. Um, it's a measure of, of self-correlation. So basically, uh, after how many pitches does a metric explain uh, half the variation in itself. That's the, the 0.7 benchmark there. And uh, in gym at, at driveline, um, using internal data, uh, Smash Factor outpaces uh, ONZ swing as well as ONZ contact to reliability. So it's a, uh, a quicker way to assess, assess the skill. <clears throat> also, I think it, it's more comprehensive for, for some of those reasons I laid out. Um, and I think uh, as I sort of alluded to, the, the biggest thing about bat to ball skill, uh, I think it's less important than, than how hard you can hit the ball, but it does play a significant role in determining how much of your bat speed, how much of your exit velocity is ultimately going to be usable, right? How much can you access frequently enough to like hang around in the big leagues, start on your college team, whatever level you're at, you need to be able to hit the ball hard consistently enough to even get in a lineup, stay on a roster. So uh, on the right there, you'll see what's a you know, pretty, pretty steep negative relationship between smash factor relative to a player's average and, and bat speed relative to a player's average, which taken at face value you know, might sort of suggest that we shouldn't care about smash factor at all, right? If bat speed is so important and being better at this metric clearly sacrifices it, like why should we prioritize it in training? Uh, but I think while that is a takeaway, I don't think that is the best takeaway from, from this relationship. Uh, what I get from this is that if your average contact quality, if your bat to ball skill is sufficiently low to begin with, uh, you have to sacrifice more bat speed to raise it to a level where you can play every day, stay in a lineup and hit the ball frequently enough to, to, to have a spot. So then if that's the case, you don't actually swing as fast as you can in game, right? Like there's no, you have no chance to make use of all of that. So all of the training and all of the time in, in developing like elite output, uh, you can't put to use. So, so this, I think this, this relationship becomes most apparent uh, when guys really struggle. Uh, and otherwise, training the bat to ball skill helps us avoid this extreme trade off or, or compromise between between speed and accuracy. Right. Uh, we want to be able to move fast and accurately enough to, to hit the ball consistently. Uh, and then finally, the, the last uh, last of our big three, the last skill I'll touch on here is uh, swing decisions. So. Uh, internally, the, the, the metric gets a little confusing, but I think the, the context that we take into account is really the biggest takeaway here. Uh, and what we, what we try to do 
is understand uh, on a particular swing versus take decision, what was the expected value of a swing versus a take based on where the pitch was. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, some pitches are just easier to hit than others. We also wanna think about the expected swing rate. Uh, I don't think a guy should be credited for making a good decision to take a ball rolled to the plate. Uh, as he should for swinging at a pitch right down the middle. Um, like I think the easier the decision becomes, like we have to factor that into our assessment of a player's skill at doing so, as well as uh, batter's zone preferences, right? Like these are not uniform, good decisions are not, uh, you know, good decisions for everybody, which is why I think the sort of two by two matrix of like swing and strike being a good combination swing and ball being bad is not uniformly the case. Um, thinking of a guy like Miguel Sano, uh, a player whose best skill by far is their ability to hit the ball hard. Like I should be okay with him swinging at some balls or some like imperfect pitches uh, because his contact is, is, is high impact enough uh, and infrequent enough that we should let him swing pretty much whenever he wants, right? Like, to, to, to some extent, uh, like just the, the way the numbers work, right? Uh, the, the more frequently I make contact, the fewer swings I need to take to have the same amount of expected contact. Uh, so it'd be wrong to sort of judge Alex Bregman and Miguel Sano on the same scale based on their independent ability to make contact. What is a good decision for, the, for one uh, may not be for, for the other depending on the situation, what the count is. Um, so all of that context, I think, uh, uh, bears, bears considering when we're trying to come, come to an understanding of, of swing decisions and batter approach. Um, for, for guys who, who do tend to, to excel in, in output, um, they're gonna be able to provide value over average uh, by hitting the ball harder predominantly in earlier counts. Uh, they, if they don't make contact as frequently, they have higher whiff rates. It's hard to separate themselves from league average in, in deep ABs. Uh, when, you know, more breaking stuff gets thrown, fewer balls in the zone, it's harder to make use of their skills. So really what approach does uh, and swing decisions, uh, contextualizes the other skills a, a player brings to the table just to give us a more a well-rounded understanding of, of how they make use of them and can sort of signal to us if, if approach is killing uh, how well a guy hits the ball or how hard he hits the ball, fitting, fitting a better approach uh, can, can help us tap into, tap into those other skills without needing to improve them all that much. And finally, I'll talk about the training uh, and how we go about beefing up some strengths, addressing some weaknesses, and, and trying to improve uh, you know, these, these tools that we've determined are, are most relevant. Um, so I think it's important to understand that uh, different training environments will, will lead to, to different adaptations, and there's a time and place for all of them. Uh, so the, the three sort of groups of environments are skill-specific ones, where we pick one of the tools, we eliminate a lot of like conflicting feedback. We're not training this in game. This isn't anywhere near, you know, replicating competition. And we just want to hone in on the one thing. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll do blocked practice where uh, it's like seeing the same pitch over and over again, um, where the, the level of difficulty has gone up. Um, it's a closer approximation of a game setting, but we're not quite there. It's more predictable. Failure is more tolerable. And then there's true random simulating competition. Things are changing pitch to pitch. The environment is completely left to vary uh, and guys have to adapt. Um, and, and I think each of these, you know, in, in their own way when deployed can, can lead to, to unique adaptations um, and, and play a role in developing players. Uh, so first I'll talk about training bat speed. Uh, I think of it, uh, is two really separate separate parts. Like there is, I think, a neurological adaptation that has to take place to, to even try and swing the bat fast. Like 
Um, it, it may be surprising, but like the, there is a, a pretty substantial number of players who, who walk in for the first time having never really been told that like swinging fast is good. Um, I think the average lower level uh, uh, hitting approach emphasizes contact frequency over quality. Uh, so unlocking the intent purely to move fast can be pretty powerful for guys. Uh, and then once that's exhausted, uh, there's the physiological adaptation of getting stronger, training in the weight room. We use uh, overload, so heavier and, and underload lighter bats um, to, to train bat speed, which sort of builds that, that physiological engine to, to produce bat speed. Uh, then when we're talking about the bat to ball skill, um, I think the most, the most effective way one is providing feedback with like a metric like smash factor rather than only prioritizing like output in, in a batting in a batting cage uh, setting. But I think shrink, shrinking the target uh, ultimately is pretty useful. So like on the right there, you see a guy swinging a skinnier bat than he has in game, which forces more accuracy with with the barrel. Uh, if we're gonna you know hit hit a ball. Uh, at, a good trajectory decently hard like he does there. Um, and then both in that video and uh, on the left, you'll see guys hitting squishy balls, which deform at contact um, and are cool because they pretty immediately will, will clue you into where on the ball you, you made impact, right? If you don't square it up, if you don't hit the center of the ball, uh, it's gonna squish and deform and roll off your bat and you'll very, easily see that, that that was suboptimal contact that you had just made. Uh, and then when we're talking about training swing decisions, I, I think it, it can be sort of the hardest to conceptualize uh, insofar as we're not trying to emphasize purely a strike zone, in is good, out is bad. Uh, we need to give feedback in some other way. Uh, so it requires us being a little more careful and a little more specific about how we relay that information. So like on the right there, after doing all of the analysis and, and working with the data, we can then bucket into to good and bad decisions independent of, of zone location, given all of those other you know, contextual factors I touched on uh, and just, just report more cleanly. Um, and I think more, more impactfully than, than just swinging at balls is bad. Uh, in a way that's actually trainable and implementable into, into our programming. So uh, we've got through how we collect data, what we look for, uh, and then how we you know, identify salient skills and attributes and train them. And I just wanted to close giving a little bit of a sort of explanation of how to put all these different puzzle pieces together in evaluating a player uh, for yourself you know, be it a, a guy you've seen some data on or just gets called up or you're reading a, a scouting report, how can we leverage some of this understanding uh, to, to better evaluate that player? Um, and, and I think I've sort of sprinkled it in along the way, but this this really sums it up. The, the big three skills are, and, and likely always will be, inter and, and codependent. Um, I think it is categorically wrong to to focus on, on just one at the expense of the other. Obviously, uh, I think that, that that output is the most important. Bat to ball is, is next and, and, and approach uh, is the least important of these three, um, but they're all gonna play a role in, in making a, a good and impactful hitter at any level of the game. And on the right there, uh, I just wanna again highlight that I think output is gonna set the floor and the ceiling, and it's the first place I look. So if there's a guy I wanna, wanna understand a little bit better, I need to understand how hard he hits the ball before I look at anything else, because that gives me, uh, like I said, that, that window, that range of outcomes um, that I can come to expect. Uh, and then within that, I can start narrowing down based on how often he's making that contact, how frequently he's making near perfect contact uh, and, and try and parse out a little bit, you know, between that floor and that ceiling, what third or a quarter of, you know, this hypothetical, 
you know, spectrum uh, I, I can narrow it down to. And then swing decisions, uh, it's not going to move you up or down significantly, uh, except in extreme cases where it's like seriously handicapping your other skills. Um, like if you're exclusively swinging at two strike sliders in the dirt, that's an example where, where your swing decision skill or your swing decision quality is like so, so far handicapping the other two that you won't be able to perform. Um, but I think it's mostly uh, for the vast majority of guys, a nudge up or down, um, but isn't, isn't going to be like the thing to look at. Uh, but certainly, certainly can move you, you know, closer to your ceiling or, or closer to your floor. Uh, so pretty much on the dot, that's that's my 45 minutes. Um, and I wanted to, to, to leave time for questions. It's a lot of information. I hope it's interesting. Um, and I know a lot of it is pretty new. Uh, so so I'll leave some time here to to monitor the chat and 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 answer answer anything that comes up. Um, Hey, hey Noah, that, that was, was awesome, man. That was an unbelievably cool look into what you guys do um, at Driveline, and it just it, it just has like so many questions on top of it. Of uh, obviously, I think you'd express a bit like the struggle of like using this stuff into actionable, um, you know, changes and results. Um, what would you say kind of is the, the the thing that you guys do the most? That is like okay, that we think is the most tangible to improvement. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the number one thing is consistency and, and having constant feedback. So every swing you take, you have a bat sensor on, there's an iPad on the ground, hopefully out of the cage. So we're not breaking them constantly, which we do anyway. Um, so, you know, on every swing you take, how fast you swung, how hard the ball was hit, where did it go? Um, and I think, the best thing arguably we can do for a guy is sort of train them to be their own best coach once they leave, right? Like get them so comfortable with the objective feedback that they can start associating that with, with feelings and be able to sort of have a launch monitor in their head once they leave. Cause like without it, right. Without sort of putting that time in, um, I think it is really hard bordering on, on impossible to be, like a true self-evaluator and, and just like watch a ball hit and be like, ah, yeah, that was crushed when maybe it wasn't. And you pounded it into the side of the cage five feet from you and you have no idea where it's going. Um, so I think, I think constant feedback is definitely, definitely number one. Uh, Nick, I don't know if it's me or you, but I cannot hear you. So <laughs> until you get your mic back, I'll, I'll, I'll answer some, some, some questions in the comments. So uh, with batters having to react quickly to, to you know, high, high velocity fastballs and off-speed pitches, uh, how much of this information are they able to take into the box and do we get pushback? Um, so I think the answer there is that most of this stuff should not be occurring like in game, right? Most of it is, is our trying to assess, assess uh, skill and devise a training plan. So when we're talking about, you know, sort of releasing guys back into competition, um, we want them to be able to monitor their progress, but this isn't necessarily like a in the box type of thing uh, uh, that, we, that we need them to be thinking about. And I think that can be, you know, pretty overwhelming to try and, you know, decide whether to swing at a pitch while thinking about like your smash factor. Like I would not advocate for that ever. Um, let's see. Is there a hitter? I can't answer that. Um, yeah. So I, I think the, the, like I said, I think the best thing we can do for a guy um, is help them associate, you know, what is, what is feel, or with what is what is real, like what what these metrics mean, 
um, and 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 how how uh, how this is all going to transfer back to their team, their school, whatever. Like the 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 purpose is not for them to to be here forever, um, as much as we'd like to. Uh, yeah. So as far as uh, what my plans are with Pitcher List um, as the new czar apparent, um, definitely going to have to work on the name. Uh, I think we're leaving out, you know, a good half of the game there. Uh, so so maybe it'll be Pitcher, Pitcher and Hitter List, open to suggestions and, and workshopping the name there. Um, are MLB teams coming on board with this tech? Are they still old school? Uh, Pretty much every org that I know of is going to be using some of this, some of this feedback. Uh, I mean, at the major league level, like there's a launch monitor at every stadium, right? That's how Statcast works. So they they have uh, they they have the 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 ability uh, to to track all this data. Whether or not they use it is sort of a, a different question. But there are orgs. Uh, so like the bat sensors, for example, it's a pretty good example. Uh, players are not allowed to wear those in game at the major league level, but there are organizations um, that, that use those like in minor league gameplay and are constantly collecting that data. Uh, so, so I'd say orgs are probably, I would hope, further, further ahead than you think um, in, in most cases um, and are using all of this feedback at some way, you know, in, in their own way. Um, a question about Sano, given the lack of consistent contact, wouldn't you want him to swing less and make sure the stuff he swings at is more hittable? Uh, I kind of skew the other direction, thinking about like the expected contact rate on a given pitch, right? Like uh, his, his contact rate times like how often that pitch is contacted. Uh, like I want to give Miguel Sano the freedom to take the most chances to hit one ball. Um, even if it's suboptimal, even if it's a tough pitch to hit, if he's hitting balls at 90% of his max, like those are still crushed. Uh, so, so I'm pretty comfortable knowing that he can best help me, uh, by, by taking some more chances to, to really run into a ball. Um, if I tell him to swing less, we're getting into more deeper counts. Each whiff now is, you know, worth comparatively more. Like with two strikes, that's the end of your at bat. Uh, so, so my sort of inclination there would be would be to free him up uh, uh, rather than sort of skew the other way. Um, and then if you look at a guy who's who's uh, pretty. Pretty good bat to ball wise, so like a like a David Fletcher or Alex Bregman, who I mentioned. Uh, I think they're best able to to separate themselves from a league average hitter, provide like unique value uh, by being better better in deep counts, right? With, with two strike counts, uh, each swing they take has a higher expected rate of contact. So to make best use of that skill. Um, I, I would free them up to to battle and 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 try and get in those deeper deeper abs. We're all Nick, good, by the way. We got it right. Everything's good. Yeah, just yeah. sorry to inform you that that in your absence, um, Chad has made has made me owner of, of Pitcher List. You so, know, I, I I figured this day would come, Noah, and uh, yeah, you've, you've certainly put in the work to justify it. I'll tell you I, that. I may have to change the. Uh, the, the handle in my in my little <laughs> to, uh, to to picture this. I I will say I uh, the I uh, the PL Plus community certainly wants to take every opportunity to hand the reins of Pitcherless to somebody else. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to that day. Now, I uh, thanks for holding down the fort, everybody. I mean, no, that was really like a fantastic panel. I, I think it's. Um, I think for especially like the fantasy community, we understand the impact that driveline has on the majors. Uh, we, we see a lot and really understanding what you guys do uh, is still kind of like lost a bit in the weeds. And you really illuminated a ton of that uh, today it is not lies. Um, we have one more question here from Mark Baseball. Any hitting development resources that you recommend, Noah, outside, of course, driveline? Um. I mean, if you're trying to develop yourself, uh, I think like lowest cost and, and highest 
payback is like invest in in like a bad sensor, some tech and start working on it. Uh, I think it's always going to be going to be probably more beneficial than 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 other paid options in terms of like reading about it and, and understanding things. Um, I think there is constantly good work being done uh, at at places like, you know, PL plus fan graphs. Um, I think the something that's 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 you know really I think appreciated a, a driveline about like the public analyst community and and fantasy as a whole is like the the drive to find and identify undervalued players and 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 under underappreciated talent um, is in a lot of ways like pretty similar and, and certainly runs in parallel to like a lot of the work we do here right like we. Mm -hmm. In order to train skill, we need to understand it. And, and in order to win your fantasy league, you should probably also understand skilled players who are going to be more resilient to chance um, and sort of go through a lot of the same like discursive discursive pro processes and, and, and sort of intuition that we use in like trying to decide how to spend how to spend training time. Yeah. Um, so I think I think a lot of public analysis is, is really solid uh, resource. And like just just in in my presentation, right? Like uh, I referenced like Jonathan Judge's like metric metric uh, selection criteria, which is like pretty foundational to, to what we do here. Um, and and people have come up with their own you know proxies for for skills. And anyone is free to like try and smash together a bunch of rates and and and, and barrels. Not to shout out a podcast, but <laughs> it's a fantastic uh, one. To, to uh, to uh, try and understand uh, some of these skills and, and use the data that's publicly available to drill down on on sort of what's signal and what's noise. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think they're all good resources if you can sort of put the pieces together and, and contextualize them by yourself. Well, all right, uh, and one more question for you because we only got about another minute or so, really quickly. What area do you think that you guys can continue improving and that you look forward to adapting into the uh, the regimen at Driveline? Yeah, so I think um, bad speed is is pretty close to being a solved problem. Like you need to try swing faster. You need to try and then swing heavier things sometimes, lighter things sometimes get stronger. Um, but I think the other two, the other two skills, like there's certainly a ton more to be found um, sure. in terms of how we can improve those. Like we're pretty clear on their importance. Uh, but like, how do we make a guy better at making consistent contact? Like that is an incredibly hard problem to solve. And there are so many guys, right, who have just prodigious bat speed, great raw power, who like never materialize as hitters. Um, and, and I think that just speaks to like how hard a problem that is to solve mm -hmm. and how far we still have to go in developing, you know, uh, products, programming, like full training regimens to address those sort of supplementary skills that like aren't going to be enough on their own but can certainly kill your your light tower BP power uh, if if you don't have them in the bag. Nice. Well, all right, Noah Thurm, guys, give him a follow, of course, at Thurminator13. Noah, this was an incredible presentation, and really, it was a it was a perfect balance between us just kind of messing around and talking. All of a sudden, like, no, 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 this is actually what matters. Uh, that's such an important uh, presentation to have. So, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciated the, the opportunity to, to share a little bit.